Let me uh, go over the, uh, uh, how the pattern was a bit different in our, uh, uh, but it, with many similarities to the stories that you already heard. We, when we first uh, started to see cases, I practiced as a nephrologist, uh, researcher into teratology and uh, in transplantation. And uh, so I saw a lot of aspirin poisoning. We dialyzed for it. And uh, we, uh, we had seen a fair number of deaths over the years. When we saw children come in with influenza, we had a very good uh, virus group working and a, a, a chemical group working with me at the time. And we were extremely well funded uh, from various agencies for the ter teratology work I was doing. And the, we had uh, how viruses worked as well. And we saw children with uh, fairly marked cerebral edema coming in and the microvesicular fatty effects. And we readily did biopsies. And we had the hyperammonemia, and we looked at the fatty acid profiling, and we were uh, a little bit, uh, and we realized it was Rye syndrome, and then we uh, we used aggressive dialysis and uh, treatment techniques. And this is a fairly typical young girl who came in after having chickenpox, uh, which was all complicated a month prior, and then one week prior to admission, she developed a flu-like illness, and on the third day, the fever developed intractable vomiting, became agitated and stupid. And, and she wouldn't take anything because she was nauseated. So she didn't get aspirin. She just didn't feel well. And uh, I, have, I have her permission to use this. She's now young. She's now a woman. And, uh, and the only thing she's upset about is her hairdo uh, in this. Uh, and uh, we, the classical uh, f treatment at the time was decompression of the brain with a uh, intracranial monitoring and you uh, you could alter their fluid status and their electrolyte status and uh, and you gradually you could bring them around and one week prior to her admission to our hospital she became somewhat agitated but she responded to pain was a painful stimuli and she had a many uh, she had a stiff neck uh, but there was no evidence of papal edema, and she handled things very well. And the lip liver biopsy just confirmed the Rye syndrome. And a CAT scan uh, showed fairly marked cerebral edema, which is the hallmark of the, of the, of the disease. The, the, the liver biopsy showed the diffuse fatty uh, changes, and the, the EM you confirmed it even more with the droplets and the, the endoplasmic mi mitochondria. When we looked at all our cases, they came out in this kind of a profile where they uh, got ill, started vomiting, and then they went through a profile of confusion, coma, and deep coma in very rapid succession. And what was struck us differently about our, our epidemic was the majority of the population was not in the, that got the disease, wasn't where the, where the children were. New Brunswick is actually the NB, Nova Scotia, and PEI are the three maritime provinces. All the cases came along in, in a water basin in New Brunswick. And uh, we had no cases from Nova Scotia. And we had a couple of cases uh, in uh, PEI. And we began to look at, well, what is different about uh, New Brunswick and, and as these children were flown into us? And, and the thing that was quite striking was that they had a very, very aggressive uh, forestry management program, and they, they sprayed uh, liberally with, uh, with chemicals. And they were, their main enemy at the time was a, a spruce budworm, which uh, defoliated some of the trees, and they uh, aggressively uh, sprayed and sprayed for this. They also had some accidents where they dumped uh, chemicals into the water supply where the planes got into trouble. And so we knew from chemical analysis that we had the chemical that they were spraying in the brain tissue of the children. And we had compared it to the ones that uh, were from Nova Scotia and PEI. But because of the controversy about spraying, we never published the data because we felt we'd end up with the court saying uh, the, the threats we were getting from the industries. Uh, and uh, 
We published the first paper uh, fairly rapidly in Lancet looking at the uh, chemical effect and then we realized that when we broke, fractionated down what they were spraying, we could not get the companies to cooperate to tell us what they were doing. We actually had to go uh, get the chemicals in a different way and then break them chemically down. And uh, uh, so we broke them down into its different ingredients and finally found out what exactly was being sprayed and what the chemical names were. And we mainly got them from employees of the companies, not from the senior management. And we then found out it wasn't the, uh, the pesticide at all. It was actually the carrier that uh, gave us the, uh, the uh, numbers. I should note that the animal experimentation were done in fairly large numbers, uh, like 42,000 uh, animals. Uh, so we knew that these weren't just a couple of dozen animals exposed to chemicals and exposed to human virus. So what, the, the environmental industrial surfactants, which are the wetting agents, if you, most pesticides are, there are three types, organocarbamates, organophosphates, and the DDT chlorinated group. The phosphates and the carbamates are oil derivatives, and so they'll just sit as a glob on the leaf. And you have to have a wetting agent to spread the oil out over the leaf and over the plant to get a better absorption into the plant to kill the pest. And so the formulations are, are loaded with surfactants. And the molecular structure of the surfactants used, which they use by the train load, not by a can here, a can there. They actually had trains full of the surfactants come in. Uh, they uh, were done in liberal amounts. The, and the ultrastructure of the livers of the animals were almost identical to the uh, the, uh, the Rye syndrome. When you gave them to pathologists, they realized they were not human specimens, uh, but they, they could not distinguish them from the children we had came, coming from the same area. So the, f the four case control studies, of course, that we've talked about uh, have been striking. We're coming along as well. Uh, and we realized aspirin also played a role. And we were very leery about uh, uh, aspirin use in children. And we would backed off on the aspirin, uh, uh, trying to get the pediatricians in the area to, to back off on aspirin use. And we were aware that the mapping of the rise cases in the U.S. and the, uh, the influenza B epidemic, which was going on at the time, were very striking. We could not get originally our influenza B that we were recovering from the kids to go into mice. And through the cooperation, I went down to give a talk at NIH at one of the state-of-the-art uh, things. And one of the investigators at NIH had mouse adapted the influenza B which we weren't able to do, but didn't have the experiments to put it into, and offered us the virus, which I then put it into my luggage and, and flew home over the border, which I could never do nowadays. Uh, I would have been in jail for a few years. Uh, and, uh, and we then grew up the virus, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and thanks to NIH, the Lee strain was, it became fairly standard in the experimental model. And when you looked at the uh, Rye syndrome profiling, uh, in, in the, the aspirin was uh, uh, very, very striking in, in some of the centers. And in others, uh, they aren't as, as striking. But certainly, aspirin and children's diseases in those days were, uh, went together. If your kid felt badly, you gave it some aspirin. And in the classical Rye syndrome in the United States collapsed almost after, you know, once we started to back away from the aspirin profiling. And we did use aspirin in the mouse model. And you could move the curve very rapidly to the lethal side more dramatically if you took the same animal that was getting dry and added aspirin into the animal's uh, uh, profiling, it, it became uh, uh, more rapidly deteriorated. And the classical rise syndrome, the red here is fat, microfascicular fat, and the animals themselves went on and developed hepatic coma and the classical changes. We spent, I, I, this is not uh, very clear, but we used to spend, uh, we, had, we were a group of investigators 
Otto Hutzinger and Steve Safer, the organic chemist, and uh, they're now in Baylor and in, in, in Europe. And Lee, uh, Spencer Lee, we had a group of virologists as well, and we would often meet at uh, my home or one of their homes, mostly my home, and we'd have dinner. Uh, my wife cooked, uh, and we'd all sit around on the floor looking at this map which came as centerfolds from science, trying to work out the metabolic roots of how this all worked. How does a chemical change your virus profiling to end up to give brain swelling and, and uh, this kind of disease? And this has really bothered us for a long time. And we, what we basically did was we pooled uh, mice from, uh, and then we hit them with the uh, with the uh, top small MPA on day four, or minimal central medium, the controls, and then they went on to have virus or control virus and control in each subgroup, and we had ongoing profilings of readings so that we had statistically large enough numbers that there were, the statistics was fairly powerful, uh, although. When I sat down with the Department of Mathematics, uh, they were very critical of it because some mothers eat their young in, in, in uh, if you've ever raised rodents, and uh, they were very upset that I eliminated those numbers from my experiment, and, and I said, but they're gone. And the mathematician said, numbers never disappear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they got up and walked out of the room. Uh, but, uh, 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 but anyway, the majority of the department stayed behind, and the statisticians did, thank God, because we, the numbers, without computerization in those days, were so incredible that you really had to have a mathematician's uh, department's cooperation, which we did. And uh, we gave them the numbers cold, without uh, having uh, our analysis at all. And they came back and said, yes, this is statistically this group and this group and this group. Uh, and what we basically did was we, when you looked at a, a few thousand animals in a control group, hit them with a the virus, they were, uh, with normal mice, there was no deaths. But as you then added the chemicals in, you could absolutely uh, modify it depending on the dosing of the chemical. And you could uh, dr dramatically, the last curve is identical as well. You could move it even faster if you added in aspirin into the profile. And the, we basically looked at a whole profile of various things because it was obvious to us that the urea cycle enzymes were very involved in this, which is a symbol of the metabolism of, uh, in, in, of uh, one particular area of your, your body that gives you ammonia and, uh, and were uh, abnormal in this group. And we looked at not only the chemical levels, of both the children and the animals, but we looked at the the various facets of both the uh, how the, did the virus change in its infectivity or not, and we recovered virus as well. There were some parts of this uh, experiment that we didn't publish, which I talked to you about. I could we could not publish the human data on chemicals. We had the after we start publishing this, and the New York Times had it on their front cover, not through any intervention of mine, but through a, a very keen reporter, uh, uh, the president of the university that I worked at wanted the whole program shut down because of pressure from the chemical industry and the forestry industry. And we were uh, uh, only the medical faculty all coming in that they would resign in mass if, the, if such a thing went on, that the, we were able to survive. We did intracranial monitoring on the mice, or I did, I must say, uh, and uh, with a supervising vet uh, group to make sure that the mice had no pain while I was doing it, and uh, they were under full anesthetic like you would do with a child. And we did intracranial monitoring of pressure. And in the experimental group, the, the, they had the exact same brain pathology intracranial uh, pressure monitoring. So you could actually reproduce the the, uh, the urea cycle defects and the same things we were seeing in the children. We tried it in Hormel Pygmy Pigs 
somebody donated through uh, one of the uh, groups with the armed forces, had some excess Hormel pygmy pigs, sent down a couple of truckloads full, thought we would like to use them. And uh, they, it did work, but we didn't realize they were a breed down from the wild boars of Borneo and, and that, and certain of our staff uh, would be, they could jump about six to eight feet high, and they could clear uh, pens, uh, be there, and they could tear you apart if they ganged up on you. And some of the staff refused to go in after they were attacked a few times by the, uh, when we took their young and start working with their young. So uh, although we could get it in a small group in, my, in pigs, we gave up on that game uh, because of the model. And we sold the pigs after having them donated, and a profit came to our lab. Uh, uh, <laughs> the liver pathology in the animals was the same as, as the human. And, and, which is, and we looked at the lipids and the anti-cardiolipin antibodies. We looked at various profilings. And interestingly, the, the, uh, the liver and the tox flu combination, uh, and it was, there are many, many brands of toxamil, and this was only one sub-brand of tox that would do it. We tried various combinations of surfactant. And there, is one, there were one molecular group that would, it would actually work with. And the, when the forestry industry switched their profiling, the rise disappeared, which is what they should have done to be in the beginning, was simply say, well, what, which brand is it? Instead of fighting us, if they had worked with us, to work out well, what part of the spray is doing it, it wasn't the actually organophosphate. It was one molecular group within their surfactant group, and when you eliminated that, the rise still, you couldn't get it to work in the animals, and it didn't cause rise in the children either. So uh, more recently, we've been looking at uh, the, what, in, what do these xenobiotics do that you cause all the toxicity? What, how do they actually work? And we knew that toxamol was made up of two constituents, and, and we, we had broken each of them down, and we knew which portions were toxic, and, and uh, trying to figure out, then could you actually ever end up making a safe surfactant? And you can. You can actually deliberately change the profiling of the chemical if you spend time with it. And I must say, having spent some time uh, in hearings in the United States, uh, the congressional hearings in the rise, et cetera, the American government actually had altered the legislation on, on spray programs to exclude certain molecular weights and certain molecular structures. So the para, uh, uh, the uh, uh, P para alpha is the master switch, which sort of regulates the energy metabolism, and it's the one that appears to be knocked down. And we've, uh, because we have the uh, long-term storage thing, it looked like it probably did it in the mice, and we did it in. Uh, it's probably what went on in the children as well, and it looks like when you do it in the animals. It's the main master switch that causes the brain and the EEG to go flat. And you can, uh, but they also are a primary mechanism for detoxifying certain xenobiotics. So this area of research is very, very crucial because it's, uh, surfactants are part of food stuff now. The, the, when I was presenting at different uh, areas you know, before government commissions, industry said, well, you know, there are surfactants in peanut butter, but the, thing, but the structure of the surfactants in peanut butter bear no relationship whatsoever to the spraying for plants uh, and, that, and structurally. But unfortunately, if you try to get what the surfactants of peanut butter are, you're in for a tough ride. And you end up having to reanalyze the peanut butter and uh, spread it out. And so it make, they make the job 10 times as difficult because you have to go back and, and break the peanut butter down and to find out is, it, uh, is that even possible. So we've been looking at uh, exactly how the master switch is knocked away. How does that actually happen to give you Rye syndrome? There are Rye syndrome still occurring, and, and we, we're not quite sure 
what they are. I, I get calls about young women who are uh, pregnant going to a fatty liver get rise syndrome and and they die and you they're they are very very much like the children we used to see with a classical rise and you know having practiced medicine for quite a while and having taken vacations where I used to work as a GP when I was a resident I did a couple of hundred deliveries I never saw it when I when I was when I was young but certainly it's prevalent in the obstetrical world now, the fatty liver of pregnancy and the, the turn down with the deaths of the mother with a live fetus, a live newborn. So uh, I, I won't go through beyond that because but basically what we're talking about is looking at how influenza B itself, and influenza by the way is a very unique virus. It has it, it gives off a neurotoxin it itself, a neuraminidase. So actually, the viruses that are involved with RISE are really incredible, uh, and the influenza itself is a, re, in a many years of research has gone on trying to understand what makes a lethal strain of influenza. Why does certain strains are be more? Are, why are they more lethal than the other? And why is it that you can have epidemic after epidemic after epidemic and not very much happens? And then you'll get an epidemic that really is very striking. And the, the, the amino acid sequencing of influenza changes rapidly from year to year. And the, the amount of neuro, the various neurotoxins and the chemicals that are given off vary per year, uh, per each strain. So that in itself has fascinated us, well, how the heck does that actually happen? But, but we don't get that answered. That's really where a lot of our efforts should be going into as well. And there's a lot of people with the swine flu saying, well, we should be looking at antivirals, and that's probably true, but how does influenza actually do this? What's the, the two that you've heard about are influenza and chickenpox. What's unique about those two viruses? And why can't you get it with, you know, uh, measles? Why don't you get it with a, another type of virus? And uh, the, uh, I've never seen it with any other than all those two viruses. Well, I'll end there because otherwise I'll be preaching. <laughs> Thank you very much.